Welcome back to the VUC Voith and Tell number 429 today. Today, March 29th, 2013. As usual, we have some people to thank, and today I want to thank Simwood.com. If you don't know what they do, you should go take a look, Simwood.com. And, of course, our PBX is provided by OnSip.com. It used to be Junction Networks. They've been around for a long time, and they are very trustworthy people. You know our wideband, full-featured conference bridge that we're using today and have been for years is ZipDX.com. Thank you, David Frankel, for being a part of the VUC as well as providing that service. Boxphone.com for the local rate dial-ins in something like 48 world cities. Now let's get to the VUC. Hey everybody, I'm Randy, and aren't we all, actually, in one way or another? We have a great panel today, <laughs> Andy Smith, <laughs> another Andy, another uh, would-be Randy, Randall Schwartz, hey Randall, uh, Dan Lane, Bye. Michael Graves, and Bob Bowles is with us, did I forget anybody, and of course the minions, the thousands of people that are out there coming in through ZipDX, yes. Give yourself a round of applause. That's very nice. Okay. And today's uh, thing is about, and I'm trying to looking uh, for. Here we go. This is what we're looking for. Big blue blood. Big blue button. Fred, you are going to have to change that name. I have not pronounced it once correctly. Fred Dixon is with us. Hey, Fred. Welcome. Hi. I'm going to uh, adjust this so that we can see the video and get a better shot which is uh, to say that I changed the focus here. Oh, and on a big blue button, we have, I'll get it right before the end. We've also got Thomas. Thomas was uh, um, instrumental in getting this thing going. He suggested it. So we've, you can see that we have six people. Wow, six people on big blue button. If I say it slowly, I get it. Let me do a close-up on Fred and see what that looks like on the screen. Okay, so those are small... Um, vignettes, I'll call them, thumbnails. But I'm going to do a quick thing. We're going to have a full demo and talk from Fred. But before we do, let me do this. So you can see that there's, in the middle, there is a uh, slot thing for slides and images. But I'm going to maximize the video. So now we've got, and let me just look at this and see if I've got the best possible view. Okay, so look at this. This is actually pretty hot. It even looks good on my local screen. I hope that this is being transmitted decent. Let's get a check from somebody in the Hangout. Bob, what does this look like to you? It looks great. looks very good. There's a little bit of camera distortion on my image. Also, it looks like I'm missing part of it now, too. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, find out from Fred. Fred, what, what was the very early origin of Big Blue Button? Um, so thanks for the introduction, and I wanted to sort of approach it where maybe nobody here knew anything about Big Blue Button, and that's one of the good questions to start. So uh, perhaps with your permission, I will just quickly go through, I have a few things to kind of give everybody like a background, the overview of the project, the history, a little bit about what we do to integrate, the roadmap of what we're currently working on, the HTML5 client. I thought if I went through that, probably taking about 15, 20 minutes, you'd have most of the sort of basic questions answered, and then we can do deep dives into anything that you'd like. That sounds great, Fred. Please go ahead. Okay. So um, without knowing anything, Big Blue Button is an open source web conferencing system for online learning. Our goal is to provide remote students a high quality learning experience. And the pain points we kind of address are the costs, sometimes, of commercial systems, the low adoptions, uh, if the user ability isn't very good for other systems, and perhaps most importantly for developers is the ability to integrate Big Blue Button deeply into existing applications. And we have some commercial companies which have embedded parts or all of Big Blue Button into their products. But our target market is really thinking about the online learning, that remote student who wants to get a high quality learning experience. It's how the project started, and I'll give you a little background in a moment. So when you think of the educational context, and, and even though I think of it in terms of universities, colleges, K-12, it really can be any 
context where you need to teach somebody online. So um, the sort of three common use cases are virtual office hours, small group collaboration, and then the remote teaching, the traditional sort of one to many. And here we kind of put some boundaries on it where we're only trying to do sessions of 25 users or less. Some people may say, well, I want to stream to 100 people or 1,000 people. That's a different architecture. That's not the system that we're trying to build. We may get there someday, but not today. And in terms of what you would expect or what you can expect from BigBlueButton, we have the core capabilities for sharing. So we have the desktop sharing. Uh, we have the audio, which we're doing now. You can see people in the audio, uh, the window, the audio window. We have uh, the slides. So the traditional model is the teacher would upload some slides and go next and previous and then can annotate and so on. There's the chat and then there's the videos. And maybe a couple screenshots if you haven't seen various ways the blue button can be used. So here's kind of like just sort of a video chat application. Um, screenshot taken with Mozilla when we were in the web forward program. That's nine people all chatting uh, simultaneously. Here's an example of you for five people. Uh, we've got some slides and some presentations and so on. And here's an example of somebody in our community who had uh, used the Moodle integration or the Sakai integration that we provided and just posted a screenshot, you know, with a thumbs up, which is always fun to see. So, and here's, a, here's one more presentation. This was used recently by Food Services Canada where they presented, the gentleman there is in Geneva, and they had presented to uh, sites all across Canada and then there was a moderator who kind of fielded questions for the presenter. So online teaching, online learning, that's the target market that we go after. And here's one more. This was actually the Matterhorn uh, developers meeting that was held a few weeks ago, and they're just using it for chatting. That's 12 people there. So I want to first and foremost give props to the other open source projects on which makes it possible for BigBlueButton to exist. Had you tried to write BigBlueButton 10 years ago or 20 years ago, no, let's say 10 years ago or 15, like WebEx or others, you would have had to have created basically all the components, the front end and the back end. We didn't have to do that with BigBlueButton. So with BigBlueButton, there's two particular projects I want to give shout out to. Red5, which is the open source implementation of the Flash Media Server, and FreeSwitch, which is, of course, as you would know, an open source soft switch. So we use FreeSwitch for the, vo the voice conferencing. So the who's talking, the mute, unmute, everything that's going, and I'm speaking now, is going through FreeSwitch. And Red5 is an open source implementation of Adobe's Flash Media Server. It does the streaming media. So my video is going through FreeSwitch. My, uh, sorry, my video is going through Red5, but my audio is going through FreeSwitch. Uh, and they're being recorded, and we can do record and playback of sessions as well. Um, other tools here are kind of more the ones that you'd expect to see. Um, and then the front end client, it's written in ActionScript, so it's Flash. And Flash provides the best game in town for access to webcams on Mac, Unix, PC across all major browsers. Um, and and I got to say kudos to Adobe. They do a really good job of supporting Flash. Um, so we wrote the front end in Flash using Flex, and the back end is primarily on Red5 and FreeSwitch. And we would not exist without those open source projects in which to build on. So. A couple stats about the project in terms of uh, what's available. We have a very active development community. There's over 1,300 members in our developer mailing list. Over the past four years, we posted, there's probably been about 14,000 messages so far. We got into the Google Summer of Code in 2010, which was awesome. We had two slots and 69 or 79 applicants. Um, very happy that the project has been forked over 1,000 times now on GitHub. It is an open source project. When we say BigBlueButton is open source, we mean it is open source. It's not, it's not perhaps some other projects in the past that were doing web conferencing that marketed themselves as open source, but if you really tried to dig through it, you couldn't find source for some of the pieces. BigBlueButton is an open source project for web conferencing. Um, and on Facebook, we got a little love on Facebook as well, a couple of followers and Twitter as well. Um, another stat I'm very happy about is that project has been localized into over 35 languages, and that's done by our community. Mozilla has been also a huge supporter of us. We were in their Web Forward program, which was an accelerator program for uh, open source projects. Mozilla is just a great organization. And BigBlueButton is the only open source project with a money back guarantee. You can't install your own BigBlueButton server in 30 minutes or less. We will give you your money back. A um, couple screenshots from Facebook. So another stat is 
uh, the last time we took the statistics, uh, from June 2011 to June 2012, we had over 61,000 installs of BigBlueButton. This is monitoring the, the packaging archive, so we can tell when packages are downloaded to install. And 14% with the United States, 8% in Germany. Much of the core development for BigBlueButton occurs in Canada, and you have to go all the way down here. So less than 2% of the installs for BigBlueButton is in Canada. So our goal at the beginning was to create a global project and, and benefit people all around the world by offering an online open source system for uh, distance education. And it feels like we're making that, making that progress. So here I actually took the numbers out, and there's Canada all the way down there. So very happy to see lots of other places in the world, uh, United States, Germany, Russian Federation, India, France, Brazil, and so on. So you asked me earlier on how Big Blue Button got started. So like all open source projects, it started with an itch. Back in 2007 at Carleton University, which is here in Ottawa, Ontario, uh, in the Technology Innovation Management Program, which teaches engineers to be entrepreneurs, it's a master's program, they wanted to open the program up to students around the world. And they were paying for some commercial web conferencing to do it, and it was not cheap. So the head of the program, Tony Belletti, told one of his students, uh, or asked one of his students, and the student couldn't say no, uh, go off and try to write an open source web conferencing system. So the student worked at it for a year, and in the fall of 2007, um, they had something working. Um, and that's when I became involved in the project. So I saw this at Carleton University, and I'm an entrepreneur as well, and I thought, mm, there's something here. So uh, we decided to spin the project out and to turn it into a proper open source project. At that point, it was just code written at a university. And uh, even though there were 150, over 150, commercial web conferencing systems, we thought that there was an opportunity to create an open source web conferencing system, much like MySQL was the open source alternative to a database. So then began the effort to create a proper open source project around it. And in September 2008, we released the first build of Big Blue Button. It had real-time audio, slides, video, and chat. And the voice at that point was free switch, or sorry, asterisk. And it was, there was no voice over IP. And then we added to it for each release. The voice over IP came on August 2009. I remember having a conversation with someone in China. And by I mean the voice over IP, we built, we took the Red 5 phone project, modified it, got it into the blue button, and then when you click the headset icon, it would make a call from the Flash client to Red 5 phone on the server, then a SIP client to asterisk and then you'd be able to talk to other people around the world. And then we did some refactoring. Uh, 0.70, which is July 2010, saw the whiteboard. And then we did more refactoring. And then on September 2011, we got the first beta in, which had record and playback. And then we, we have very high standards for the release. So between that first beta and the final release, we did four beta releases and three release candidates. Um, and the benefit of that is we don't have to go back and fix things. We really do make sure the last release candidate was literally out there for two weeks. We had fixed every bug. We had everything we were sure is, is done. Um, and then we had uh, waited two weeks, and then there was nothing else anybody reported. We just changed the label and called it uh, 0.81. And we're now working on, sorry, 0.80, and we're now working on 0.81 with our 11th release. So our philosophy is even though it's an open source project, we treat every release like a product release. So all the testing, all the stability. Um, for us, stability is so important to the project that, uh, that people can build on it. So we are, as open source developers, we're not marketers. We believe the best marketing for the project is word of mouth. So it's very satisfying when we see other people blog or tweet about Big Blue Button um, and say all things about it, good, bad, ugly. Um, so here's an example from Julian Ridden, who's very active in the Moodle community, um, giving his comments on Big Blue Button. And we're very close to the Moodle community and the Sakai community, the two major open source learning content management systems. Um, there's lots of adoption of Big Blue Button at universities and colleges, not surprising as well. This is Darren Ricketts from the University of West Scotland that uh, had done a, a testimonial on Big Blue Button. We just, this just came out. We didn't see it. We didn't, we didn't do anything. Darren, Darren put it out. And uh, there's a regional innovation center called JISC that uh, does reviews and supports universities and colleges in the UK. And they had also done a very nice uh, analysis of the blue button. And it's available there at the URL. The uh, creator of Moodle, uh, Martin, Martin, uh, Martin Dugamayas, uh, who I met, I met just a few weeks or a few months ago, which is great, um, 
also has some very nice things to say. I mean, he's doing an open source uh, asynchronous learning content management system, and we're doing an open source system. So there's a nice for synchronous learning. So there's a nice collaboration there and a nice fit. And it's worth part of giving a context for what does Big Blue Button. Big Blue Button as a server by itself does have some API examples. You can set it up and use it, but you would find Big Blue Button more embedded inside the context of something else. And well, it could be WordPress or Joomla or Moodle or Sakai. But just to give you an example, the, the Moodle integration, what it would look like, um, if you wanted to set it up, you would first need a Big Blue Button server. So some people sometimes think, wow, well, I've downloaded a WordPress plugin. Why can't I run Big Blue Button? Well, it's because you need a Big Blue Button server somewhere. Um, so if you were to set one up yourself, uh, we recommend um, like you know, Ubuntu 1004, 32-bit or 64-bit. And we're going to move it to 1204 at some point. But for this release, this coming up release, it is still on Ubuntu 1004. And that's all done by packages. That's the install of 30 minutes or less. You'd follow the instructions. And at the end of those instructions, you would do a sudo apt-get install Big Blue Button. And on a clean server, it would install the Big Blue Button components plus about 150 other packages, it would churn through it, and after the magic is done, you would have a server running. To integrate Big Blue Button with another system, Big Blue Button is controlled via an API. So you can think of it like a black box. And there's a well-defined API to create a room, join a user, end the room, get the recordings, and so on. But it all comes down to what's the URL and what's the shared secret for making the API calls. So you would take those two pieces of information and you would put that into, say, a Moodle plugin. Uh, we've written a Moodle plugin as well. Uh, so you would put in the URL and the security uh, shared secret. Once you do that, the Moodle plugin could then make calls to the Big Blue Button server. So an example would be in the Moodle interface, there's a UI to help you define the name of the classroom, say the welcome message. Uh, do you want people to wait until, uh, do you want Mo Big Blue Button to wait until people have joined? Integrate with the Moodle calendar. You want it recorded, and so on. So Big Blue Button doesn't come with a scheduling system. We made a decision early on not to create a scheduling system. We made a decision to create an API and focus our efforts on Big Blue Button itself. If you think about any collaboration as having a before, during, and after part, sort of like walking into a physical classroom for, the, for their la class, or this, or this session as well, things go on before, like scheduling, invites, emails, calendaring, and so on. That's taken care of by the third-party application. But when you hit the during part, when the real-time collaboration goes on, the voice, video, chat, desktop sharing, that's the big blue button. And then the after part, when you're, say, accessing the recordings, that goes back to the third-party front end. So we focus on the during part. Um, so after, big, after Moodle integration here is you've got a link inside your class. Students will come and click on. So depending on they've already logged into Moodle. We single sign them into big blue button. You do the interface. You collaborate back and forth. And then, for example, in Moodle, you have an interface to access the recordings at the end. So once the recordings are available, uh, students can come back within Moodle, and teachers can come back and say publish and publish or delete the recordings. So uh, again, the API is surfaced inside of a third-party application. And this is what the recordings would look like. So in the current version of Big Blue Button, the one that was released on June 19, 2012, we record the slides, the chat, and the audio. And the audio, of course, was picked up from FreeSwitch. And we use Popcorn to play it back. So it's synchronized playback of HTML components. So as you scrub back and forth, you'd see the current slide. And the chat would show you the state of the chat. So it's, it's like event-based recording. And we did it that way because after the recording's done, all the raw media, the slides, the audio, the video, the, uh, and the chat messages, and so on, and all the events like who's talking, who left, who posted messages, so all is one big XML file, and then you have the sorry, you have the media and the data, the data of all the events in an XML file, and then Big Blue Button has an infrastructure to let uh, things process that for playback. So I could have taken, or you could create a playback format that says that's called by Big Blue Button after a session's done, and it just grabs the chat and emails it out. For example, so it's a very modular architecture. So we have since our release. So this now, the next question people will ask is like, well, what's currently going on in the project? What's the current activity that you're doing. And this is what we're doing for the current release of Big Blue Button. So it's always good to understand the context. And we have a very systematic development process. Again, that's where we treat it like a product release. So we do our specs online, and we do the development. And we're still in the development of 0.81, but we're nearing to beta. Beta for us is we've updated the package and the documentation. There's a test, build and test environment. The VMs are ready to go. And there's no more major bugs. 
Our belief is that when beta occurs, we as a developers can't find any more bugs. And therefore, when people try it out, they have a good experience, and they also find those edge bugs. So we will find go through a number of beta releases. There will be a release candidate, which means the bugs are zero. And then we do the final test in the community, and then we release. So right now, in development, we're here. We're getting close to beta. And this is what we've got planned for uh, the current iteration of Big Blue Button. So we're adding for record and playback, record and playback of all the activity in the presentation area. So my whiteboard marks, my, my pan and zoom, and so on would all be recorded for playback. Plus, where we're going to recall the webcams. And I show, I'll show you an example of what a screenshot looks like. Um, we've been working with Seneca College in Toronto, where they've had two students working on adding accessibility for students with disabilities in Big Blue Button. That means if you have a screen reader, you should be able to tab to the interface, which is really important for schools and colleges because uh, any student that can't hear or can't uh, see still must be able to participate in the session. Um, we've added a text tool for a whiteboard. There's a layout manager to help kind of manage the windows a little bit. We've added more APIs for third-party integrations, like a JavaScript API that you can call Big Blue Button from within inside of a JavaScript page and maybe a, a change some of the events, like join or leave the audio. So instead of me clicking on the icon, the web page could decide that the user can join the audio. And we've updated the skin, and we're adding support for the IMS learning tools integration. So I've got some screenshots here to share with you. So that's what the text tool looks like. So we're just adding another button. This is the toolbar, which I can see here because I'm the presenter. And when you do just click and drag, you'll have a text field which you can type into. The, uh, the layout manager is going to allow users to just better organize the windows. So they're free form, but sometimes you need a little bit more control. So you'll be able to switch back and forth some layouts. So here I am switching back from one layout, which uh, shows the users and listeners. And here's another layout, which just gives more prominence to the presentation area. And with the layout and the skinning, you can kind of do some fun things. So here we just skinned everything completely black, made the video chat, sorry, the video doc uh, larger, and now you have almost like a video chat application. Well, actually, it is a video chat application. There's, everything else is hidden. Um, and it does some things where if you click on one of the uh, windows, the videos, it will make it larger than the others. Okay. So the record and playback, this is probably the thing we worked on the most, was um, the first iteration of Record and Playback was to get an architecture in place whereby we could capture all the media and the events and have this workflow to process them. And then the first output we created was, was this, the slides, um, the chat, and the audio. And this is what the Record and Playback will look like in the version we're working on now. So all the webcams are recorded. So the video goes through Red 5 and we record those as streams. And in post-process, they're all mucked together. So if you had two people talking, they'd be side by side, and then the third person joins, and then the video would switch to um, and this is a static video file, right? This is all post-processed. Um, the chat is the same. And then the presentation area will now record all the whiteboard moves, the mouse movements, the pan and zoom, and so on. So it's a richer playback of what went on during the session. Some of the JavaScript interface through a JavaScript API, so you can embed big little button in a div tag. You'd be able to things like mute everybody, lock everybody, share a webcam, and so on. And we, have, we will have API examples of how to do that uh, when we ship uh, the beta for big blue button 0.81. In terms of the accessibility, you'll have like a whole bunch of shortcut keys. So again, someone who is um, visually impaired will be able to use JAWS or a screen reader to tap through the interface and have some shortcut keys to go to various points of it. Lots of good work. And again, very much thanks to Seneca College. Um, and as an open source project, that's kind of how we like to, to see the support from others is um, we are trying very hard to build an alternative to the commercial web conferencing systems. And it's great when other uh, groups pitch in. And in terms of the user interface, we branded Big Blue Button for a number of organizations. So we thought for this release, let's do some branding for ourselves. So this is what the uh, UI is going to look like in the newer release. It's taking some of the look and feel that we've done on the HTML5 prototyping we've done, um, but also, too, we've unified the users and listeners window. So, uh, and the funny thing is, the reason, it's, the reason there's two windows, there's a user's window and a listener's window, was in the beginning, we only had asterisks. So the only time you knew somebody was in a conference is when they pick up the phone and called in. And that kind of stayed with us for a while, but now we're going to unify it. So uh, you'll be able to see all the people, and then if they uh, hit the headset icon to do voice over IP, you know, you'll see the uh, microphone appear next to their name. And if they call in, you'll see the number here as well, or the caller ID, whatever comes up. So it'll look a little bit more cleaner and modern.
that is where we're going to. And then the next question I we usually get asked is, okay, well, what's the roadmap for the project? What's your, your vision behind the project? And, and I mean, obviously our vision is to enable remote students to have a high quality learning experience. Um, we're open source developers, not marketers. So the success of that vision is judged by our community. You will never see any of the developers stand up in the community and say, hey, Big Blue Button is awesome. You will see us stand up and say, we are trying to build a viable alternative to commercial applications and it's for our community to decide how we're doing. And we listen very closely. So the things that we have on the roadmap, for each release, this is the kind of priority which we go through in terms of development. Stability comes first. We are prepared to work as long as necessary to ensure that each release is more stable than the last. The last release was pretty stable. Um, so uh, we've been working very hard to find all those parts which, um, which are, uh, can be improved in stability. And we've certainly done some things with regards to tunneling uh, when you're behind a uh, firewall. Um, and we did that. We used a newer version of Red 5 and been working very closely with two of the developers in the Red 5 community to integrate the newer version into Big Blue Button. So it's great. We find some bugs in Red 5. We fix it. They find they help us find some bugs in Big Blue Button in terms of stability. We fix. So I think I think I'm feeling positive about um, improving the stability over the last release. Um, the usability is next because what use is the feature if you can't use it? Then there's features and then there's modularity. And the modularity really speaks to enabling others to embed parts of Big Blue Button into their project. We we always had this vision of having like a Big Blue Button toolbox. So there's kind of two ways you could have built Big Blue Button. You could have built the individual components separately and then combined them together, or you could have built a whole system and then broke them up into individual components. And we started with the latter. That way we could provide something that works out of the box, and then over time it's become more and more modular. So some of the things that we're working on for, or we expect to be working on, so none of this is planned yet. We just finish the current release. We usually wait about five minutes, then start planning the next release, but we only think in terms of the current release. So on our roadmap, things in the future is certainly full record, record and playback for everything that goes on in Big Blue Button. Um, additional components, we actually we get questions for synchronized video playback. So I'd like to, just as I can start in a page in a slide and go to the next slide and I can control it for everybody, I'd like to be able to do the same thing for video playback. Um, polling module, there's another thing. Shared notes and breakout rooms. And in, in all of those, you know, we get asked for it, but when we were asked for, like, do you want breakout rooms or would you like to record and play back? Then usually people would say, well, we would really like record and play back first. So that's usually the priority we go. And what we have been working on since last summer is an HTML5 client. So it's still prototype. Our philosophy is just create lots of prototypes and we learn by doing. But the idea is that you would have an additional entry point into Big Blue Button. Because while I give lots of props to Adobe, um, HTML5 and the interface, uh, you will be able to have this whole type of capability inside of HTML5. Um, but we're going to do it in stages. Again, that's what we did record and play back in stages. If we tried to do everything at once, we would never ship. So we try to do the highest possible value with the least amount of effort so that we can get something out sooner than later. And for us, what we've been working on is sort of what we call phase one is a viewer client. So everything at Big Blue Button is there. We're building on top of it. You know, if you had to build a web conferencing system from scratch, you'd still need slide conversion, record and playback, API, all the tools, documentation, everything. So that's all in Big Blue Button. What we're adding is an entry point through an HTML5 browser. So that entry point would provide, at the beginning, the ability to see the presentation, so all the stuff that I'm doing here, uh, a single webcam, single audio stream. So it's a viewing client, and you'll do two-way chat which starts to speak more towards like, I want to put larger number of users than 25 in a session. Most of the time, if you have a large session, not everybody's going to need to talk. So the idea of having a viewer client where you could pick up an iPad or an iOS device or an HTML5 browser and watch what's going on in the Big Blue Button session um, would be very useful. Then the next phase is the two-way audio and video. So we've been prototyping with WebRTC as well. Um, you know, looking very closely at the free switch support for it and the, and the asterisk support for it and the libraries. And the good thing about Big Blue Button is we're already using free switch. So the moment we can make a WebRTC call to free switch, we should be able to do that and nothing else changes. Um, all the events that we get from who's talking and so on are coming back through free switch. All the recording that we're doing in that whole workflow is done by free switch. So only thing changes is the audio path. So we're, we can leverage everything we've got so far. 
And then the, the third phase would be a full HTML5 client that can do the presentation as well. So you could become presenter, upload slides, control the, uh, the mouse movements, and so on. I have some screenshots here. So this is the this is the design of what the absolute simplest HTML5 client would look like. It would just be the presentation area with kind of a UI control to say, hey, there's more controls if you click it. So we tried, we, this is the second iteration to the design. Um, this is to be a very progressive where the user interface goes through very simple to what a viewer would want to do up to what a presenter would want to do. So a viewer would want to say, see who's online, chat, see the webcam, hear the audio. So if we do that, uh, here's the current webcam. Uh, this would be the audio session. And the idea with that, this would be bridged right with the big blue button session. So if you're on an HTML5 client and someone chats, you don't care whether they're on a Flash client or HTML5 client. You just saw the chat and you would write back. Um, and the, you know, the, web, the most movements are going in as well. For the participants, we, we sort of first design was to show it all. But here, we're just going to show the participants in a drop-down menu. Most of the times, you won't need to see them anyway. And then here's some screenshots of the prototype. So this is actual screenshots of a prototype, which is bridged into the uh, Big Blue Button server. So you can see the people who come in, the current slides, the chat. And here is side by side of the prototype. So uh, here in the Big Blue Button client, uh, we have some slides, and I'm drawn on the whiteboard. And here in the HTML5 client, uh, you can see the slide, and you can see the whiteboard. And you can see there's a little gap, and we actually fixed that recently. <laughs> so you're seeing the mouse moving around, and you're seeing the whiteboard movements as well. And here is the prototype running on an iPad. So we're doing HLS streaming to get to an iPad, again, using GStreamer streaming server to do it. So lots of other pieces to bring together. Again, the HTML5 version is not part of the upcoming release. We're doing it in parallel. We're going to finish this release first that we've been working on, and then the HTML5 along that uh, those phases. Uh, will merge into the next release. So in summary, we believe that every student with a web browser should have access to a high quality learning experience. And we intend to make that possible using the blue button. And that's the information that you can find out more about our project. So thanks for the opportunity to give you kind of a, a high level overview of the project. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions anyone has. Um, and just probably worth pointing out, I'm the product manager for Big Blue Button. So I'm the one who's responsible for um, the product management of it and the delivery and the QA. Uh, and I also do the packaging as well. And you'll see me post a number of messages in the forum. So um, fire away at any questions you have. OK, Fred, that's excellent. Really, I am, I'm totally blown away. Um, my first tests, and I think a lot of people would say this with uh, Big Blue Button, button I don't know. I'm sorry. I have a handicap, I can't pronounce it. But besides that, the original evaluations, uh, a lot of people have agreed that it, it wasn't optimal, and yet it looks fantastic. And I have a full screen, so things are not super visible, maybe. Uh, but you can see the screen, which I think is good, because we're live. So those of you watching either live on YouTube or watching the recording of YouTube, you're seeing uh, what we what we're seeing in the presentation we've got what one two three four five six seven people in uh, we've got some video I'm gonna zoom in there's some questions as well I'm gonna zoom in on the videos just to show you that this is this is really nice too it's really quality I'm going to do what you said which is to can I minimize the slides we're done with that right Fred Oh yeah, you okay. you can control what so, what you see on your end. So, so you as a viewer, I'm so totally to, minimize. What I'm just going like. to do this temporarily. I'm going to bring up. Hello, Thomas. <laughs> I'm going to bring up the uh, video maximized, so you can maximize the video. Um, Randall asked an interesting question, and then Michael uh, Graves also has a question. Randall, if you want to unmute and ask your question, it's a good one. Sure, sure. So uh, you were actually on Floss Weekly, but uh, my show, but I wasn't the uh, host that week, so I didn't get a chance to actually talk to you. Um, uh, so what's what's the profit model? How are you making money doing this? So um, I actually wear two hats, but the hat I only really want to talk about in this session because I, I is the open source hat. But I'm also an entrepreneur as well. Uh, there are a number of commercial companies that provide commercial support for Big Blue Button. Uh, I work at, I'm the CEO of one of them, um, and we earn our money through the traditional open source business model. We provide services, support, 
uh, hosting, branding, scaling, integration for the Big Blue Button community. We take the revenue for that, we pour it back into uh, the development of Big Blue Button, and we make it better. So uh, it's a sort of like a, a two-sided market. There's there's people who are using Big Blue Button. There's people who are providing services. Um, we figure the better we can make Big Blue Button, the larger the market is for us and other companies providing commercial support for Big Blue Button. Uh, we want a very healthy ecosystem of companies who are are involved in Big Blue Button, universities and colleges, and commercial companies using Big Blue Button, and developers finding value, contributing to it, or building on top of Big Blue Button. Um, and that's where I go back to. We want a real open source community uh, where everybody has a commonwealth to the better they make the project, the more value they get back. Cool, thanks. Okay, and as um, I think Bob mentions in the um, IRC, if I click on Fred, he will... There we go. So let me do this properly. Yeah, I, I meant to do that, and I got lost because uh, I'm trying to remember who has questions. Uh, Michael Graves had a question. Michael, uh, are you ready to unmute and, and ask your questions? Oops, not unmuted, though. Okay, unmute in the Hangout or unmute in Big Blue Button? Uh, probably the Hangout is good because I think... I can hear you. Okay. Okay, that's cool. Um, how much of what you're doing with uh, the media, the uh, streaming media, the audio and the video, is, is within your grasp or being done by the subsystems that you're leveraging. For, for example, do, do I get, if I'm an administrator, do I get to determine what kind of resolution I'm going to see in the, in the, uh, the webcam feeds or even that I, I want to use something other than a webcam? So um, we, to answer the question of sort of the feeds and the, the control, we're using Flash to broadcast the video. And so uh, in this case with the version 0.81, uh, we're leveraging the H.264 ABC codec that's going to come out that's, that's been in Flash for a while. You have lots of options in the configuration of a Bigwood Button server. What resolution settings are available to users, 320 by 240, 640 by 480, or uh, 1280 by 720. And as that video is going from Flash to Red 5, it's also being saved as well. So you have control later on as to what you want to do with that media. Uh, so the example I gave earlier in the record and playback, we're going to be using it to create a playback of the um, slides, chat, presentation area, uh, and the videos as well. So we're not using anything except Flash right now to capture the video and stream it to Red 5. And once it hit red, hits Red 5, Red 5 is a streaming media server. You could rebroadcast it live if you want to get into the nuts and bolts and figure out the, the name of the video stream that's coming in. Um, but right now we're saving it and you can process it later on. Okay, so it's at, at the server side then I can configure it. It's not a client configurable thing. So there, it is client configurable in that uh, when you loaded up Big Blue Button, a uh, single XML file at some point came down that said to Flash what components to load and what options each of those components have. So okay. in the, we call it the config XML. Uh, you can specify for a client what choices they have to share their webcam. You can restrict it so only the presenter can share his or her webcam. And in the newer version of Big Blue Button we're working on, we, have, we made that config XML dynamic. So you would be able to say from the third-party application, um, this user is going to join the session, but I want to enable, enable this user to have two choices in the resolution. This other user is going to join the session, and I don't want them. I only want them to have one choice in the session. So you would be able to create, take the existing config XML that everybody gets as a template, um, which tells all the components like load the chat window, load the uh, load the video, the presentation area, and so on. You'd actually be able to have fine-grained control over each user's configuration options for that config XML. Okay, cool. Jerry's got a question. Uh, Jerry, are you able to unmute and ask it? Um, if you can hear me, that'd be a good You're thing. Good. You're good. Okay. Um, I play with Big Blue Button a number of times. I'm, I'm very curious now, and probably going forward, what are you guys looking at on the hardware requirement side for, and how, how big of a session can you actually hold on that hardware? Right. So uh, we're always very conservative in the guidance that we provide in terms of the capacity for Big Blue Button. And to be honest, we learned this from FreeSwitch. Um, 
if you look at the FreeSwitch FAQ, there's an FAQ that says, what is the capacity of my FreeSwitch server? And the FreeSwitch developers have like a little narrative that goes along the lines of, we have learned from past experience not to give out hard numbers, uh, and we actually have learned that lesson as well. Um, so why we say you should use Big Blue Button for sessions of 25 or less, there's not a hard-coded number. I mean, 26 is not going to break the server. And in terms of the server hardware, we recommend at least a four-core uh, CPU, 2.0 gigahertz or more, four gig of memory. Um, and because we're using the Speaks codec in Big Blue Button, uh, specifically the Flash client, so Speaks is very CPU intensive to encode. It's a great codec, but it's just CPU intensive. So you will find that if you have lots of bandwidth, the bottleneck you will probably hit first is the CPU limit on your server to transcode simultaneously many streams of, of uh, audio. Um, so the limit will depend on your probably your CPU capacity. Um, some of the commercial companies providing support for Big Blue Button have tools that can stress test the server by providing by creating 100 or 200 or 300 real users. Uh, these are web browsers that are already on remote servers and load into your server and see at what point your server starts to have problems. Um, another thing we get asked is, um, well, why can't Big Blue Button support 200 simultaneous users or 400? Why can't I just stream the audio so, uh, to all the users? So it, it, the reason it's because of the way we designed Big Blue Button. Um, our belief, our design was to enable um, very high quality collaboration, um, and that means everybody has the ability to talk. There is no concept of a stream of just audio. So in Big Blue Button, you can have 12 people all sharing their webcam, all talking at the same time. We like to think we solve the harder problem as opposed to let's just create a system where I only ever let one person talk and it's just streamed to everybody else. So we can do that later on, but we wanted to solve the problem of providing small classes small to medium-sized classes, a very highly collaborative environment. Because as well, that market segment is much larger than the segment that just wants to stream to a large number of users. So we have to, sometimes to build something which satisfies the needs of one market, you have to just say no to another. And um, sometimes the job of a product manager is saying no more often than yes. So I'd rather see Big Blue Button do the things that it says it does very well and then build on top of that um, and just to quite be honest with other people that if you're looking for something, um, yeah, we're getting some echo here. Just be honest with other people if you're. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, we're getting, okay. just we're getting some echo here, and it's a little confusing. And I'm seeing John Covici, and John uh, may have a question. There are a bunch of questions in line here, but let's try to. Um, I'm trying to mute John on uh, ZipDX, and I don't know if he's gotten into the conference or what, but John, if you could mute yourself, John Covici, and um, let's take the questions in line. I, let me let I you had finish. a follow-up, Randy. Yeah, I, I know, Jerry. Uh, if you were ready to hear Jerry's follow-up, uh, Fred, otherwise finish your sentence or whatever. Sure. I wanted to interrupt because that echo is driving me crazy, and it's probably getting into everybody else's head, too. Um, Jerry. Um, yeah, on that note, I, I'm, I do fairly large cloud architectures, and I'm, it basically sounds like Big Blue Button is a bit decoupled, and I'm kind of curious, are, have you guys looked at you know, scaling it out on the cloud, or is somebody currently working on that, or is there interest from other parties on that? So it's a good question. So from but the open source hat, we pour all of our effort into making that single Big Blue Button server as stable, usable, and scalable, and sorry, stable, usable features and modular as possible. Um, recognizing that if we do our job right, um, for most organizations, a single Big Blue Button server will be s more than sufficient. Um, and you can always throw a bit more hardware at it and get a very powerful server. If you want to scale out to a larger number of users, then that's where, um, on the open source side, our focus is a single server. Uh, I would take you back, suggest you check out some of the companies that provide commercial support for Big Blue Button, who do have load balancing solutions, who do help other organizations scale it out. And it's a kind of a nice split because if you are looking to scale it to a large number of users, it's likely you are probably in a commercial context. Um, and in that case, the traditional open source model kicks in quite nicely, where you can run Big Blue Button on 10 servers. Nobody is going to tell you you have to stop because you haven't paid a license fee. Uh, and you could certainly build out. Anybody is certainly willing, welcome to build out. Uh, scaling and load balancing solutions. 
but the developers who perhaps know Big Blue Button better than others um, can offer those solutions as well, and it provides a, a very complementary opportunity to um, to help the commercial companies fully more fully leverage the use of Big Blue Button. So there are solutions out there, and I'd encourage you to go to the Big Blue Button website if you're looking for commercial help on doing it. Um, but it's very the Big Blue Button is open source. All the pieces are decoupled. You could run free switch on one server and Red Five on another. Um, that config XML file that comes back tells each of the component where to talk to. Uh, you could run the desktop sharing on a server on a third server. You could you could really spread Big Blue Button across over multiple components. Um, and uh, so you have many many options. You you can build one out yourself. You can certainly look at how Big Blue Button is and set it up. You can make use of that modularity. And you can also uh, seek out other companies who could provide you help. Well, yeah, con congratulations because I've, I have watched Big Blue Button over the number of years that it's been out there in the open source community, and uh, it's it's it looks phenomenal. It's come quite quite far since the last time I actually touched it. So, very impressed. Thank you. Yeah, I gotta say the client experience is really good. Uh, this is um, really very good. I think we're in it unanimous there. Uh, it's fantastic. Congratulations. I want to get Dan Lane to unmute, so I'm going to talk for like 20 seconds while he does that, because he has a question, and there are many other questions. Thomas has a question. You guys get ready to hit your mute switch and so on, and uh, we've done well so far. I congratulate everybody for their muting. Uh, Dan, your question? Yeah. Um, thanks, Andy. Hi, Fred. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask, uh, move away from the technical side of things just slightly, um, is you're aiming at um, education facilities, uh, but are there any features coming or planned that are more towards the e-learning side of things, so more like um, with feedback from students and participants? So things like quizzes and um, questionnaires and things like that. So, yes, yes. Uh, so definitely the polling modules. Um, so the polling module uh, was actually also Seneca College worked on it, and it actually will be merged in. It's actually already merged into point eight one, uh, but we're not going to make it kind of like um, immediately visible. We're going to sort of take a cue from the Sakai project where there's core modules, things that have been tested with an inch of their life. There's uh, stealth modules, things that are there in the core that you can turn on and experiment with, and there's contributed modules. Um, so in Big Blue Button, everything's sort of built together right now, and we do that so that the localization will kick in. We don't have the ability to have multiple localization files. Um, so the polling module actually will be there, and we did that so Seneca College could just turn it on and use it in their context. Um, but it doesn't; it won't take away from the stability or the usability of Big Blue Button because we're we're um, we're not sort of saying that that's ready for core yet, but it will be there. My hope is that as Seneca College uses it and others use it. Um, the all the features of the polling module kind of settle down, and now you'll have that that next obvious piece that you'd like to have is if you do have 25 people in a session and want to poll them, it'll be something that's very you'll have something that's very nicely integrated with Big Blue Button to do that. So you will have the polling capability in the release coming up. It will not be enabled by default, but you can just enable it in the config XML. Um, we'll provide documentation and everything, but by not having it enabled by default, we're kind of signaling that this is still in the work. But probably the best way to accelerate the development of it is to make it available to those that really want to tinker with it and use it. Uh, so you'll see it as a core module in uh, in a future release. Cool. Thank you. I hope the next person in line is Thomas. So if you can, uh, uh, let me see. He's got a, I got a message from him just in case he can't. No, that wasn't it. Thomas, are you able to unmute and speak? I'm not sure where you're connected. I see you on the. Uh, I can speak on the big blue button if you don't mind. That works. Works for me. I just wanted to ask because you mentioned about an, an iOS app. I just wanted to ask if there are any plans for an Android app. Um, so an Android app has been in development for over two years now uh, by the MCOMP project. The MCOMP is a project that came uh, has originated in a university in southern Brazil. Um, so they had done an Android client, native Android client, that provides the, uh, the audio, the video, the chat, but not yet the presentation area. Um, and to be honest, um, I think what, and I'm not going to speak on behalf of the project, but I think what they're really looking for is the work that we're doing on the HTML5 client. Um, 
they, you can do two-way audio on the Android client, but an HTML5 client, it, it, well, let me back up. The Android client is actually quite a little challenging to do because now they're faced with trying to replicate all the presentation, the, all the fidelity we provide in the pre presentation area in the Android native client. Um, in the HTML5 client, you will have that fidelity. Um, and I was kind of careful. We're actually not building an iOS client. So for native iOS, or sort of iOS devices, we will provide the ability to stream the audio and video through HLS the presentation area and the two-way chat, and it's only a single video, but you'll hear the audio bridge, obviously. Um, but we will, you will not be able to broadcast audio video from an iOS device unless two things happen. Uh, well, three things. First one will never happen. Flash will run on iOS, so it's Apple's decision. And, and actually, it's not a bad one, because I think it, it encourages the other browsers to provide very good support for Flash. The second is if Apple provides support for WebRTC and Safari, um, which would be very good. Uh, so when we have the two-way WebRTC in the HTML5 client, um, that should just kick into play uh, on the iOS. We expect to see that two-way WebRTC uh, support provided in the Android uh, HTML5 browsers. And you may be thinking, well, Chrome has a browser that's available on iOS. Yes, but Apple does not allow a browser to use its own rendering engine. So the actual core inside of it is still Safari. Uh, and the third choice is if the Big Blue Button Project or one of the other members involved in the Big Blue Button Project decide to build an iOS device. That's always an option. But we kind of believe that if we put our effort into building a really good HTML5 interface, we will still at least be able to provide a streaming option for users on iOS devices. That was a screenshot of the iPad being held up next to the development environment. And if we do that, that should increase the interest and adoption of Big Blue Button and will make it more likely that there will be more customer pull to per build uh, an iOS device. Uh, and customer pull is really important. Some of the features in the Big Blue Button project um, that you'll see coming in this release, it's like the text tool for the whiteboard, have actually been pulled through by a commercial company that came to us and said, we get it. Big Blue Button is open source, and it's doing 95% of what we want. And if we just waited, you would do this other bit that's on your roadmap, the text tool for the whiteboard. But we don't want to wait. So here, tell us how much effort it's going to take. Here's the money to do it, and we want it now. And by doing that, a couple of things happen. One is you accelerate features in Big Blue Button. Uh, the developers involved um, are all entrepreneurs. So uh, we're not monks. We earn our money by providing support services and accelerating features. So it supports the ecosystem. And that company that accelerates the development of the feature gets to set the requirements. But when we do the requirements, we don't do one-off requirements. We will do it in a general way. And sometimes it takes us a bit longer. But um, by and large, pretty much a lot of the components you see in Big Blue Button, the desktop sharing and others, have been um, either improved or, or, or accelerated the improvements through um, interest of companies who want to build these components inside their uh, commercial products. And another thing, too, is that the work that we do for commercial entities, none of it is proprietary. So again, we made a decision early on that if we're going to do something for a commercial company, um, we tell them two things. One is the work that you do will be in an open source project, um, and there's no transfer of intellectual property. You will sign something that says all the work is in the open source project. That way, you will be everybody else later on can benefit from that work just as you are benefiting from the work that everybody else has done previously. And I should point out too, the license for Big Blue Button is the LGPL license. So it's a permissive license. Um, in the beginning, we actually did have the AGPL license for the desktop sharing component, thinking that that was the component that a commercial company would likely want to buy a commercial license for. And there's nothing wrong with the dual license business model. Um, it provides a way to, for companies to earn revenue while building out open source projects. However, it's a very um, non-friendly license. So again, we had to make a decision. Are we building an open source project with a small community or a large community? We opted for the large community, therefore all of it's under a permissive license, in the belief that the larger the community, the more adoption, the more support, and basically the larger target market that we and other companies providing commercial support will be able to sell into. And that's the approach we've taken. I know we've got a whole list of questions. <laughs> My typing needs work indeed. Um, who is uh, missing here from the questions? There was a repeat from... We have Carl as a backup, of course. Um, looking, there was a huge, huge uh, stream here. 
Someone asked a question in IRC. James, are you able to unmute, by the way? Or is he even still here? We lost James. I don't think he's in the audio channel. Yeah, maybe just ask if you could be proxy and just ask me the questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm them. looking for them, but uh, they go by pretty quickly. Oh, uh, Michael asked, and uh, he could ask this, but I'll—it's just one line. It's, is the move to HTML5 a move away from Red? Michael, you better clarify this. I guess it, it comes to, is the move to HTML5 in any way a move away from Flash? Does, it, does that mean that there might, conceptually down the road, be something that was more independent of Flash? So we talked a lot about this internally, of how we can best support HTML5. And uh, the conclusion we came to is that if you were going to build a web conferencing system, you would need a lot of the components already in BigBlueButton. Um, and that there was a lot of legs left in the existing Flash client. A lot of work went into the Flash client in this release of BigBlueButton. The unification of users and listeners and so on, addition of polling module, accessibility. And so we decided that we will definitely continue to continue to invest heavily in the Flash client, but that the HTML5 client will be an additional entry point into BigBlueButton. And by having these three phases, it makes it easier for us. So that first phase is a streaming client in HTML5. We're not saying, hey, we're going to duplicate Flash inside of HTML5. No, it's going to be a completely separate client with, sorry, a completely separate interface with this functionality, with this way that it positions. Um, and then we will go through phases and phases of adding more functionality to the HTML5 client. So it, you, will, you don't have to use the HTML5 client with the glue button. Um, but it will be an additional point that will be increasingly expressive over time. And then by the time we get to the third iteration of the phase of the HTML5 client, where it's two-way audio, video, chat, presentation, um, I think the answer to that question will kind of be obvious. Whether we do any more work on the Flash client or we um, on the HTML5 client. But I, but I don't think it's going to be either or. I think it's going to be a shifting of resources. At some point, if we do our job right, the glue button flash just fades in the background. It just seems to work. It's easy. And people go about doing the teaching or the collaboration they wanted to do. Same thing with the HTML5. So in some ways, I don't think that the, the feature set for the Flash client, once as we go down our roadmap, probably extends much more beyond that. Um, our goal is to provide the core capabilities for collaboration, not every feature that everybody wants, which makes it usable for nobody. So, um, no, we're still investing heavily on Flash because we have a really solid platform. Uh, we're adding an HTML5 entry point to it. That HTML5 entry point will be able to be peered with the Flash, so the chatting two-way back and forth and so on. The HTML5 will become more expressive over time. Um, and if there is ever a point, which you'll probably see, then it realistically is some more of our development efforts shifting over to the HTML5 as the Flash kind of just settles down and just does the job that it's meant to do. OK. Any other questions of any kind? I have, I have a usability question. From, uh, as we look at this at the moment, um, we're, uh, we're seeing it, obviously, as a user, not as a moderator. Um, so so what, are the, what are the differences with this when you, you become a moderator? And for, for your presentations and so on, what can you upload to that? What formats are actually supported? Is it uh, pretty generic or what? So um, we use uh, the PDF to SWF converter on the back end. So we recommend you upload as a PDF file. We also use OpenOffice. So if you upload any document recognized by OpenOffice, GIF image, an Excel spreadsheet, P PDF, or PowerPoint, or Word, uh, we'll pipe it through OpenOffice first to get that PDF, and then we'll convert it to Shockwave format. So the answer is really anything that we recommend PDF because then there's no font substitution that goes involved in the server. But if you, in a pinch, need to upload a Word document or a PowerPoint document, uh, definitely do so. It'll be converted. Uh, there'll probably be some font substitution, so you won't get the fidelity of PDF. But with the newer versions of Excel and PowerPoint and Word, just save it as a PDF. Microsoft supports it directly. Uh, and in terms of the interface that you see, if you are a presenter, you will see like a toolbar like this. I have it on my side here, where you can choose drawing tools, text tools, thickness of the line, um, 
So I'm actually pointing at my screen here, but you would see text, you would see a, a toolbox for the whiteboard, for the, for the presentation area, and you would have a bit more control over the audio. Uh, so you'd be able to mute and unmute other people or lock them so they can't unmute and mute themselves. Um, that's pretty much the additional functionality you have as a, as a presenter. Okay, Let me so comment too that people are, um, I'm sorry Andy, I was just going to say that to people who are watching this, either recorded or live, that obviously we're just watching the video chat. I maximized the video, not the video chat, but the video conference part. Okay. So, uh, and I'm not the presenter, so I can't show you that. Uh, we should have maybe thought of that, but it's too late now. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, Fred has explained it pretty well. Andy, did you have a follow-up? I had something that, w that was slightly different in that uh, I, I was intrigued about the uh, the actual call recording or the presentation recording as to how that is available. As, do you actually end up with a, a, a single file which you can effectively just play in a flash player? Good question. Right. So that's a good question. So this session right now, uh, what's happening is all the events that go through the server, like who's talking, who's joined, who's left, who got muted, the chat messages, um, who raised their hand, these are all being recorded in Redis. Um, and at the end of this session, uh, a process will kick off and the Big Blue Button server will go through all these events and create a single XML file that is time sequenced. And then in that XML file, there'll be references to a presentation was uploaded or this particular slide, or the audio started for this user and ended for this user. So in the archive of the session, the raw data that was captured, you'll see this XML file, plus all the individual um, video files, plus the audio file that comes from FreeSwitch, the WAV format. So once that's done, um, it's all there for scripts to post-process. So we have written a script uh, called Slides in this release, which is Ruby, that goes through, reads the XML file, pulls out the references to the chat, the presentation area and the audio and creates a single playback slide, single a set of web pages that let you play it back uh, using Popcorn JS. Um, so we'll give you all the raw media and the events, and um, and then you can do your own things with them afterwards. And this, again, I, I, this is actually a harder thing. It was a little harder to do because if we just wanted to make a video of it, it might have been easier. But we figured that. Um, if there were interesting things you could do with videos, um, YouTube or Google would have figured it out with YouTube. But if we can give you the raw data, so the slides are there, the individual bursted PDF pages are there, which means you could do full text searching on them later on, for example. We'll give you the, you don't have to do text, you don't have to do OCR, we'll give you the raw slides that were uploaded so that you can do things with them. Um, that's what we provide in Big Blue Button. Splendid, um, that sounds really and, quite interesting. Uh, Okay, I, I'm pretty so, sure we have. A uh, there's some documentation at the Google Code website that uh, that will tell you all about it. And and actually, I'll, I'll I'll interject. I noticed there's a question for Thomas there. Are there any plans to enable SIP inbound calls to a Big Blue Button room by default? Um, it is. And in the room that you were in right now, in the welcome message, it actually gave you a phone number and an extension you could call. So we have um, a SIP trunking provider provide us a dial-in number that will terminate on the free switch running the Big Blue Button server. So you could literally pick up the phone and call in, and your your caller ID will appear in the listeners window, uh, and that's what we're getting from the um, the event socket. I, there I didn't see a and SIP. Be bridged in. I didn't see a SIP URI. Is that what you're saying? That there was a SIP URI? Oh no, that's what he's asking. Not a SIP URI. I, I oh, okay. I misunderstood. You could set up a SIP URI, obviously, because free switch is bridging all the audio calls for the session. So. Um, We've, we've done all the work. All you need to do is just perhaps add a little bit more work that, that would um, expose the, uh, the IP address and allow SIP to have inbound calls um, you know, from any IP and then just make available the, uh, the, the SIP URL. We, we could, but it is, it's not something we've, we, um, we did for this session, but obviously all the pieces are there. Okay, and I wanted to be sure to get John Covici to unmute if he's muted, because he was going to try and ask hello, a question. Hello. Okay, John, can and you, I know you had. Can a, you hear me? Yes, and I know you, you had, had a question. I had a couple or questions comment. actually. One of them was uh, for the accessibility point of view, which is always my uh, <laughs> right. idea. Is there? Right. And are you, are you going to uh, do the flash controls accessible? Because most people, there's a lot of accessibility in Adobe, but most people never do it. Uh, or are you doing this some other way, or how is this going to function? And also over the H, the the uh, I have another question about the codec, but let's do one at a time here. 
Okay, so the um, the accessibility is in Flash, right? So we we made uh, I know some folks at Seneca College worked very hard on this uh, so that you would be able to tab through the interface using the accessibility APIs that JAWS or other screen readers would expect to find. Um, so it's it's all there native in Flash. We went through all the effort to make sure that the Flash client, the big blue button, Flash client, uh, fully supported accessibility. So that's coming in this release. There's probably more testing that needs to be done on it, but I know some guys at Seneca College have worked long and hard on it, so it'll be there natively inside the Flash client. Great. Uh, the other question is, how come you're using Speaks and and not G, like something like G722, which would be a lot somewhat less CPU intensive and it's still wideband? Uh, uh, why are you using Speaks? It's a it's a more so Speaks. Uh, uses very low bandwidth and uh, it was natively supported by FreeSwitch and so it, it gave us the best of both worlds which was high quality with low bandwidth but of course there's no free lunch right you, you give up in some area or you gain in some area you have to pay in the other so it uses more uh, uh, CPU but um, it's, a, it's an open source audio codec that was working very well for us so um, you know we use that for one other people could certainly switch it over if they wanted but uh, it was the one that's yeah, worked it, best it, for us, and that's what we stuck with. It seems like easy to do in free switch is change the codec preferences, and you're in, you know, you have it, right? I mean, that's all you need to do. Yeah, I agree with Dan. Opus, 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 all the yeah. way. <laughs> opus, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, opus gives you, op op opus opus gives you class, all of the advantages of that. Of, we would of, be uh, able to turn it on in instantly because free switch is now supporting Opus as well. Yeah, low bandwidth, high quality, low latency, whatever you like. Really, free switch does support open. So, but so so uh, Fred, you're saying Flash doesn't? It's Flash is the bl blocking point here. That's correct. Okay. Who have I forgotten with questions? We have a lot of questions, <laughs> but we need to get to them before Carl, of course, because Carl has his own intro. Anybody? We're kind of running long here too, which is fine with me, but Fred may have other things to do. James is on the phone or talking to MI5. I'm happy to answer as many questions as you have. This okay. is this is great, guys. Anyone before Carl? Okay, this is James. Can you hear me? I'm on ZipDX and on Blue Button. Yeah, we can hear that you're on, not only are you on both, but you're echoed, so choose one. Well, am I echoing? Yeah, choose oh, I one. I do apologize for that. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Um, now, now you've put me off. I forgot what my question was. All right, uh, try again. Yeah, we've kind of... Now well, I'm I'm fine. Fine. Echoing, but just make the question short. And Go we ahead. Can, we can yeah. hear it. Well, I just muted him on the other one, on ZipDX. Go ahead, James. Speak. Speak to us. Am I muted or unmuted now? Yeah, I can we can hear you. Yeah, please go ahead. I can hear myself coming back on the yeah, well, now you know what we feel no like. idea which microphone is live <laughs> uh, go ahead and ask your question we can hear you yeah you know what I've we, we, we covered off a little bit um, the um, support for mobile devices when you, you talked about the um, the Android uh, development in Brazil um, can you speak a little bit more about where the uh, the mobile development is going? It's of particular interest. Right. So the question is the mobile development. And so from the point of view of the core developers of BigBlueButton, we are not planning to build a native mobile client. We see that there's a larger opportunity as the first step to build an HTML5 client that runs on a mobile device that over a series of iterations get progressively more expressive where first it's a viewer client then it'll be two-way with WebRTC then it would be full presentation controls as well as we go down that road um, as you probably know the, the if you're gonna write a native iOS client you're going to write a native iOS client you're gonna be compiling a native application uh, and cannot you know and, and, and you must implement your own audio and video streaming back to whatever the server is that we're using 
or or bridge a tube, you know, uh, uh, have, a, have an intermediate bridge. So we could do that, right? There's nothing technically preventing this, but we believe right now um, our efforts are better served by improving the Big Blue Button core, adding the HTML5 option to it, and doing those in a way that works really well, as well as we can do it, and expanding the market segment. And at that point, maybe someone will come to us and say, OK, I get it. Big Blue Button does 95% of what we want, and we want an iOS client, so here's some money to do it. Or someone else may step up in the, in the community and say, um, I will now build an open source uh, iOS client for Big Blue Button, and we would like to, and I'd like to work with the core development team in doing it. That would be a very good day, because uh, that road is not a not a short road. Um, so either 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 we do such a good job in the HTML5 client that the need for an iOS native client uh, decreases, or we do it, or someone else does it. But it is open source, and um, if there's enough demand for it, I have a feeling that it'll get done. Okay, in that case, in that light, I think we're ready for this. And now, here's Carl Fife with one final question. Carl? And he has to unmute. There we go. There you go. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay, so, um, so first of all, thanks for um, all you've shared so far. It's been really fascinating. And, uh, um, so I, my question has to do with My pleasure. That, uh, you touched on a long time ago. Uh, which is, uh, you said that um, you know to sort of serve the needs of Group A, you you have to make um, you have to say no to, to Group B. Uh, one of the things specifically you cited was uh, that the product is not uh, ideally situated for larger groups, groups may, maybe more than 24 or 25. Uh, uh, individuals in sort of a one-to-many rather than many-many. Can, can you can you tell me some of the specific conflicting design priorities that you considered um, that you that you thought were sort of mutually exclusive? So um, one of them was that uh, to create a user interface that could allow twelve simultaneous webcams being shared, um, that was different than a user interface that would restrict you to one. Um, to enable 25 or 35 or whatever your server would support in the session to speak very fluently, uh, you had to build it out where everyone had a two-way channel. Um, so the way I look at it is this. If we achieve our goals with Big Blue Button for that, those use cases, um, there will be a lot, or there, we hope that there will be a lot of adoption of Big Blue Button. The step to go to limit the amount of data that's going out to a particular client, like a streaming client, um, we're actually doing that with the HTML5 client. So the HTML5 client for the phase one will be a streaming client. There will be a separate server that's streaming the audio and video out to the HTML5 client. Um, the HTML5 client uh, is using Backbone JS to, uh, through WebSockets to communicate back to a Node.js server. The Node.js server is watching Redis. So all these events that are going by in the Big Blue Button session are getting mirrored out to the HTML5 client. And we believe that we can actually achieve some of the, the, the desire for people to stream out a large number of users through the HTML5 client, since it's starting off as a streaming anyway at the beginning. The, the reason I didn't come out and say this up front is we're still prototyping the HTML5 client. Um, once we get to a working version, we will test it, and then we'll see what the results are in terms of the scalability of it. But because there's no two-way audio and video, and we're using things like Node and GStream or Streaming Server, I believe that we will probably be able to stream out to a larger number of users than you would uh, expect, uh, and you would, you would reasonably do in a big blue button session. So we had to make some decisions on the market we're going to go after, but I think we will be able to be better positioned to provide the streaming to larger number of users that have no interest to do two-way audio, and two-way chat is good enough um, in the work that we're doing now on the HTML5 client. So I would just say keep a close eye on us. You'll see us do the release of 0.81, our 11th release. We're very close to beta. And then after we do that release, we'll be shifting some resources, more resources onto the HTML5 client. That work will merge into the next release. And then we, uh, you will see more options for having larger number of users in Big Blue Button that still gives you, ideally, the best of both worlds. A very usable, stable feature, core features for highly collaborative sessions, and an increasing amount of options to stream out to larger numbers of users. 
Fred, I have a question for you. Very often, um, Carl, unless you weren't done, maybe you had more questions. No, I just, well, just my only my only comment was yeah, it's it's interesting because not necessarily anything fundamentally uh, mutually exclusive, except for the idiosyncrasies of the underlying technology, which is, I guess, uh, you know, always the case, <laughs> you know. So. Okay, so, uh, Mike. Sorry, but you were done. Okay, looks like uh, we're still on the air here. Uh, my question had to do with the open source aspect, uh, Fred. Actually, a couple of things. First of all, are you looking for? You know, you we've got uh, hundreds of people who eventually listen to all these things, and they may or may not want to be interested in beta testing. Maybe some of them are in uh, educational institutions and so on. But the first question was um, maybe about how many people are actually uh, contributing code, if you want to talk about that a little bit. And also, are you looking for anybody? And if so, where's the contact there? Because you have a very um, vertical audience here. So this is the time to, to, to come out with that kind of thing. OK, so it's a good point. So if you go back to this, if, uh, if I put the slide back up, or just go to bigbluebutton.org, that's mm -hmm. the sort of landing part. Um, we have, there's approximately six core developers, or six core committers to the Big Blue Button project, the people who have the rights to check in code into the GitHub repository. Uh, those are the committers. Those are the ones who are responsible for reviewing code. Um, and I am one of the committers, and I'm the product manager for it. So at the core, um, Big Blue Button isn't like, it, it's the, 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 the governance model for it is there's a small group of core committers who take on the responsibility for ensuring the quality of each release. There's not 150 people who can all check in code. But that's an alternative open source business model, and there's nothing wrong with it. The challenge with Big Blue Button has always been um, when you're dealing, as you know, with audio and video, um, it must work. A website can take half a second to return or maybe one second to return. But with audio and video, it must work. We're very highly attuned to any distortions uh, in the audio and video, and it must be stable. You cannot have a class where there's 25 people and all of a sudden something goes wrong. Um, we're not saying we're perfect. You know, there's, there's bugs in any piece of software. But for us to achieve that level of stability, uh, what we did was we adopted a very small core group of committers. Outside of that are developers who contribute to those, contribute to those committers, uh, fixes and, and, uh, or improvements. And we have a, a developer mailing list where you can post to and watch the threads. For somebody as a developer who is interested to contribute to Big Blue Button, I would guide them to the bigbluebutton.org website, go from there to our Google Code site, and read the FAQ entry about how to become a committer in the Big Blue Button project or a contributor. You would need to sign a joint license agreement, a joint, a joint or a contributor agreement, which is based off the Sun uh, joint contributor agreement. I know it's not Sun anymore, but I always fondly remember to it as Sun. Um, which means that you must give over the copyright and so on to the Big Blue Button project. Um, and uh, we would more than welcome people to try out Big Blue Button on the developer side. Um, the other challenge, too, is some of the things we're doing are not trivial. You know, doing the record and play by architecture took us over a year. Um, doing the audio and the video uh, is quite a lot of effort. But there's a very good list of bugs or issues for enhancements and things to fix that somebody can contribute to. So as a developer, there's lots of FAQ stuff there. Definitely try it out. And uh, if you're listening to this in the next you know, week or two or whatever, we don't have the 0.81 ready yet. I would even encourage you more. Once we release 0.81, we'll have all the documentation updated. You can go try it out and, uh, and, and do, um, build a development environment, try making some changes, and so on. If you are a university or college or commercial company that is looking for integrated real-time collaboration, then I would suggest I would offer that you should go check out Big Blue Button and download the server uh, and set it up and run it. And if you find and share your experience with others, um, we are not marketers. Uh, if you we believe the best exp the best marketing is that comes from our community. And if you try out Big Blue Button, I would ask that you blog or tweet about it. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Right? We are not interested in. Um, uh, anything except what the experience of Big Blue Button is, and say good things if you if you want, and say give give us good feedback if you want. Um, we very much welcome that because it builds the interest around the project. Um, and and then also I would say if you're a, if you're a university or college or commercial company and you like Big Blue Button and you would like to 
one question you ask is, okay, this is great, but where do I get that service level agreement? There are some commercial companies that provide commercial support. You'll find them off the Big Blue Button website as well. Uh, and some of them um, pour a lot of their effort back into the development of Big Blue Button, uh, and it's how the ecosystem and the, uh, a lot of the development gets done. Does that include hosting, Fred? Are there people uh, in Europe, for example, yes. that are doing hosting? I, I, I ask that for a reason, but uh, uh, it's, it's a good question just universally. Other places in the world, in other words, um, that are doing that or might do it? Yeah, and I mean, uh, one of the options is, you know, um, you could go to a company that provides hosting for Big Blue Button. You could go to a company and say, look, I've got a Big Blue Button server. Can you set up Big Blue Button on it? Can you stress test the server? Can you help me integrate it? And that server may be from a local hosting provider that's, mm. you know, it's your server. You pay the X number of dollars per month. You know, get something along the lines of what we recommend as the Big Blue Button, you know, a server. Um, we recommend at least 100 megabits bandwidth, upstream and downstream. You know, four core CPU, 2.0 gigahertz and above, at least four gig of memory. Um, so go to, um, I can't remember any European hosting sites offline, but go, go somewhere where you, you can just pay X number of dollars per month for a dedicated server. Uh, you'll have an IP address and a use, uh, and a, and, a, and a, an ability to log into it. Uh, I'd say first go through the documentation. You should be able to install it in 30 minutes. Um, if you have questions about scalability, integration, and so on, you can certainly post to our forum, to our community. You can also approach the commercial companies. Um, so you have many options of how uh, for hosting it, whether you'd like someone else to do it, whether you want to do it at a hosting vendor, whether you want to do it inside your company. You have many options. Very cool. Um... Yeah, I'm going to look into that because um, my wife teaches at uh, three business schools. And I can't remember the software they were using, but they did a, a thing uh, one time a few months ago, and it was, uh, I don't even want to go into it. It was really quite unsuccessfully done. And it was uh, specialized for education. So I'm doubly impressed because I've seen one iteration of things that was used in uh, specifically designed for education, and I thought it failed miserably. And then we've seen this, which I can see has a huge potential. With that, I'm going to ask for last questions, and while I'm waiting for last questions, we'll also see if, uh, Fred, if, if there's anything at all that we have not covered. Uh, I think it's been pretty wide-ranging, but if you can think of anything, anyone have any last questions, first of all, including Carl? <laughs> I think we stumped Carl. Fred, is there anything we missed? I really appreciate the time you've taken here, and you did a great presentation. Obviously, it's not your first. Uh, no, I, uh, again, the development of Big Blue Button has been going on quite intensively for four years now. Um, we're on to our 11th release. Uh, we've had lots of interest around the world, lots of help and localization of it. Um, my goal uh, is to provide uh, uh, an open source web conferencing system that enables remote students to have a high quality learning experience, uh, to build an active, healthy community where the ecosystem of developers, companies using Big Blue Button, companies providing support, educational hosting and vendors, educational use using Big Blue Button. Uh, and I welcome anybody who's interested to go to the website, try it out, blog or tweet about it, um, tinker with it as a developer. Um, if you want to roll up your sleeves and actually start helping out, pick a bug that you see and try to fix it. We'll help you out. Um, time is a precious commodity. So we are, a clo uh, we are a very tight group of developers who um, take on the responsibility for this project. Um, if you post and say, I want to help out, or how do I do this, it's harder for us to respond to that than someone who says, you know, I've set up the development environment, I'm trying to fix this bug, and at this point I'm getting stuck, and here's some code, and here's what I'm seeing. That's much easier for us to help out with. Not, not surprisingly, right? So my, my thought would be is, if you like what you see in Big Blue Button, Tell other people about it. Spread the word. Uh, the exposure will ultimately help our open source project as we try to build a larger community, and that will um, have follow-on effect of, you know, um, building a larger community for everybody to benefit from. So that's my message. Just tell other people about Big Blue Button and share your experiences. Okay, Fred. Thank you very, very much again. Uh, we hope to hear from you again as uh, things progress. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to share. Um, lots of things will happen this year. If you'd like, I'd be happy to come back in a number of months ahead and give you an update after this release and probably on our HTML5 client and stuff with WebRTC and anything else that you can kind of see us touch on. Um, 
you can I can certainly share more as we as we make progress on it. And again, thank you for the opportunity to share the work that we're doing on the project, um, and and for all the good questions you guys gave. I think there's a quite a testimonial in the fact that everything has stayed up, including Google Hangouts, ZipDX.com, and of course Big Blue Button, which I almost pronounced in sequence for 90 minutes plus. With that, we're going to stay stay tuned for uh, the mature audiences only version of the VUC, which will happen in just a second. This concludes our test. Had it been an actual alert, you would have been instructed to go to VUC.me. If you happen to be in Europe, please don't miss the chance to come and meet up with the VUC in Berlin. We'll be converging on Kamailia World, which is April 15th through 17th in Berlin. And you can get more information on that at conference.kamailio.com. Check that out, please, and don't miss a chance to taste some wine with us.